Hello, everybody. I am so glad, so happy that you chose to join us again. Uh, I am, um, we are still, of course, on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. And I author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors that a special providence watches over their welfare and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. If you recall, we have ventured out from our main scripture of John the 8th chapter verses 31 and 32. And last time I got ahead of myself and said that we were back on the main road but not so we are still on the scenic route uh looking at how much the father loves us all if you recall we just took a pause and so we just kind of unpaused and so we're looking at how much the father loves us whether we love him or not romans the fifth chapter verse eight says but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't wait for us to love him. He loved us even while we were his enemies. And so we are looking at that love by way of Jesus and Nicodemus' uh, nighttime conversation. We pause for a minute and ask the question, why a Pharisee? One thing for sure is that the Pharisees certainly presented themselves as enemies. I did a word search on Pharisees. And of course, as expected, lots of references came up. I didn't read them all, but what I did read would not look good as a character reference. John the Baptist called them a brood of vipers. Jesus warned the people to beware of them. He pronounced woes and called them hypocrites. They were always following Jesus around, trying to find something to arrest and even kill him for. Always asking, trying to ask questions in hope of making him appear to be an imposter. They even accused him of using the power of Satan to drive out demons. Over and over, they shouted, they showed themselves to be enemies to Christ. To quote Maya Angelou, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time, which makes it more amazing that God would choose Nicodemus to be the one given information so lofty. Nicodemus is so amazed with the conversation that he constantly responds. His constant response is, how can these things be? John, starting uh, the third chapter, starting with verse 10 says, you are Israel's teacher? said Jesus, and do not understand these things? i tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people, do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came down, who came from heaven, the son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the man, son of God, uh, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Nicodemus, being a teacher of the law, a scholar, in the study of the Old Testament should have been open to Jesus' teaching. 
His teachings should have made the Old Testament come alive. Jesus' teaching should have been what made it all come together. The Old Testament was pointing to Jesus. The law and the prophets were pointing to Jesus. If the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and the chief priests had been interpreting the law and the prophets correctly, they would have been primed for Jesus' teaching, waiting for his arrival, not surprised and in denial. Jesus marveled at the fact that Nicodemus was Israel's teacher and knew nothing of spiritual things. He knew the facts recorded in the scripture, but failed to know the truths that were there. When I was in college, many years ago, one of the required courses was a programming language. I think it was COBOL. Then, as now, it, it was so foreign to me that I couldn't even think of it in an intelligent manner, let alone write any commands or, or take a course. My dilemma was that I had a, already had, going into this class, a high overall GPA. And to fail that class would bring it down considerably. So, my solution was to memorize all that I needed to know. Long story short, my plan worked. I made an A in the class. But... I knew absolutely, positively nothing of the language. I memorized the information, but I didn't have a working knowledge, nothing that would prepare me to actually use it. I couldn't apply it to anything. Uh, I, I just memorized it. It appears that that was the predicament of the Jewish nation. They were well schooled on the Old Testament, but they missed the application part. Jesus makes a strong statement. He says, I am telling you the truth. I speak to you of what I know and have seen, and yet you do not accept my testimony. John's testimony concerning Jesus is that he came to his own and his own did not receive him. At this point in Nicodemus' life, he did like so many of his day and of our day, he rejected Jesus. Jesus says to him, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? Think about that. Nicodemus, had seen the miracles. He had heard the teachings. He is now having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jesus. His interest has been piqued, and yet he does not believe. He is talking to the source, and yet he does not believe. The real verse is only revealed to us by Jesus. He is the only one that came down from heaven. And since he is the only one that came down, then he is the only one that can ascend to heaven. Jesus' origin is from above. He's from heaven, out of God himself. He is superior and preeminent. When we see Jesus, we are seeing God's being in essence. Put it plainly, we're seeing God. In John, the 14th chapter, when Philip asked Jesus to show them the Father, Jesus replied, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me, has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you know, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. 
Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. The miracles that Nicodemus and the people had seen testified to who Jesus was, and yet they didn't believe. As humans, we are earthly, and we only know earthly things. The only way we can, can know heavenly things is that it's revealed to us by someone from heaven. And, and that can only happen if we are open to receive it. Jesus is that someone. He came to us from heaven. Therefore, he is the only one qualified to tell us heavenly things. And now we have the Holy Spirit. Verse 13 says, No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Then, at this point in the conversation, it's as if Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, uh, like, like, like preachers say, I'm closing now. And, and so in his closing, he illustrates his point by using an Old Testament story that Nicodemus should have been well familiar with. That of Moses lifting up the bronze serpent found in Numbers 21. The children of Israel, just to give you a recap or, or a summary of, of what was happening, the children of Israel were doing what they are known to do, what they were known to do, mumble and grumble about the conditions of the wilderness, wishing they had never left Egypt, hating on the manna God had provided. They had been on that journey long enough to know better. They, they just should have known better. You, you know how your, how your parents or your mama especially would tell you after you got a certain age, you should know better than that. So they had been with God long enough to know better. They had seen too much, had experienced too much to still be talking about Egypt. God punished them by sending fiery serpents to plague them. You ever think about that? Uh, most times, when, when, when I think about it, you know, when I read it, I just think in terms of a bunch of snakes, which is plenty bad, but God sent fiery serpents, meaning they were ready to attack like hungry pit bulls. Their job was to attack. And their venom was poison, was deadly. Needless to say, the punishment worked. They repented of their sin and begged God for mercy. God told Moses to make a bronze image of a serpent and lift it up on a pole. And whoever had been bid bidden could look up at that image and live. And take note of, of, of what the people wanted. What they, they asked Moses to pray to God to take away the snakes. But God did not do away with the punishment. He provided a solution, a remedy. In the making of the bronze snake and lifting it up, God provided a remedy, a solution to the serpent problem. And when you think about it, it wasn't a complicated solution. God didn't tell Moses to call a committee together to discuss the snake problems they were having. And, and, and he didn't say uh, call, call a committee together and discuss the snake problems and take a vote on what needed to be done. He, he didn't appoint a group to investigate and come up with a consensus of how to handle the snake problem. When I think about how complicated we humans would have made it 
Can't you see us trying to kill the serpents or trying to make an antidote for the poison or even doing something stupid like trying to capture them? No, none of that. The solution was very simple. Look up by faith at the uplifted serpent and live. The only way the people could live was to look up by faith. If the Israelites believed God's message, he looked up at the serpent, the lifted serpent, and he was healed. Just that simple. If you believed, you looked up, and immediately you were healed. If a person did not believe God's message, he did not look up, and he died. No, that it was an individual thing. Each person either made the decision to look up or they made the decision to not look up. Jesus parallels himself to the bronze serpent on the pole. Just as the serpent was lifted up on the pole, Jesus would be lifted up on a cross. Anyone who looks to him will be saved. New birth is secured by two acts. The first act is Jesus' death. Just as the serpent was lifted up, Jesus said that he must be lifted up. The children of Israel, they had a great need. They were dying from the poison of the fiery serpents. Today, we too are dying from the poison of the serpent the deadly poison of sin. The serpent is symbolic of Satan, who is the evil one. Jesus destroyed the work of the devil by being lifted up. The, the serpent hanging upon the pole that Moses lifted up symbolized the defeat of Satan. By looking up at the defeated serpent, Israel was healed. Today, we are healed by believing in the Son of Man who has been lifted up. The serpent was a cursed creature from the very beginning. And Jesus became a curse for us. In Galatians 3 and 13, it says, Christ had redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every, every one that hangeth on a cross, on a tree. And the second act by which new birth is secured is man's belief in Jesus. By believing in the Son of Man being lifted up, we will not perish and will have eternal life. When, when I think about how God himself in the form of Jesus Christ, was on this earth, and the people did not believe. They even shouted in one voice, crucify him. And when you think about it, in this day and time, everybody still does not believe in Jesus. There are even countries in this 21st century where you are literally putting your life in danger to believe. You can't help but wonder if some of the people that Moses was dealing with chose not to look up. Remember now, these are people whose favorite pastime was grumbling, complaining, and murmuring. Can't you hear them complaining about having to look up? So why we got to look up? What's that going to do? My neck hurt. Why can't God just get rid of the snakes? And on and on and on, just one excuse right after the other. Even after seeing the healing of other folk, they still didn't look up. They, they probably still was like just too mean, too stubborn to look up. The latter part of Numbers 21 and 9 in the King James Version says, And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. That word beheld 
means more than just a casual look. It means to look intently, to gaze intently with strong intensity. Sin and death came into the world, into this world through a look. And the only deliverance from sin and eternal death is by a look of faith. To look means to exercise faith. And the only way to be saved is through faith. To those who were bidden, it may have seemed like a foolish remedy, but it worked. To the wise in this current age and ages past, they may see it as just too simple. To all the naysayers, the remedy still works. Look up in faith and live to god be the glory well loved ones that is all that i have for now i hope you enjoyed a safe and wonderful holiday uh, since we last met i'm happy to testify that the lord has added one more year to our years of marriage we have now made it to and beyond 47 years. That is God just showing out. And we get no credit. That is simply God showing out. Until next time, be safe and pray always. And as you're praying, watch God change things. With that, take care. Bye-bye.